worry me about our current condition are taking place uh, under an administration that was elected on a platform of reform and change. And there has been, in fact, very little reform and very little change. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a very sad thing, and, and it's a disappointing thing, and it's, it's I think, uh, disappointing to many people, who, including myself, who supported Barack Obama during his campaign on the basis of what he had said. And it, it's also, I think, a great tragedy, because when, uh, when Barack Obama was elected, he had uh, a historically very, very special opportunity to do something about all of this. Um, he was elected based on a platform of change. He was elected with an overwhelming mandate. He had enormous majorities in both houses of Congress. And in addition, the country was in crisis. And everybody recognized that. Unemployment in the United States was going up more than half a percentage point per month when Obama was elected. And I think that if he had really tried to do something about these problems, he could have affected a, a really substantial change in the United States in the course of American history. And I think we're all going to be paying for a very long time for the fact that for whatever combination of personal political reasons, he decided not to, uh, decided not to try. Obviously, there's been very little financial reform. Uh, a, a huge complicated reform bill has passed, uh, but the reforms that have been enacted are very piecemeal, very incremental, and they're also discretionary. Uh, very few reforms were mandated. The overwhelming majority of those reforms that have been put in place, and, and they're very weak and insufficient, are things that uh, individual regulators or regulatory bodies could easily reverse at any time. Then, of course, there's the fact that uh, there has been absolutely no punishment for what has happened. Nobody has had to give back their money, uh, and only a handful of civil cases have been filed. No criminal cases. Uh, the only two criminal cases that have been brought in connection with the crisis were uh, two Bear Stearns hedge fund managers who were acquitted uh, two years ago, and they were not very senior people, and they were acquitted, by the way, in part uh, because uh, prominent American academic economists were hired at great expense, hundreds of thousands of dollars, to testify in their defense, something that happens all too frequently now. And uh, there's no doubt whatsoever that there was massive criminality in the genesis of this crisis. And in, in earlier financial crises, the United States went 40 years without having financial crises. In earlier financial crises, uh, which began in the late 1980s, people did go to jail. In the wake of the savings and loan crisis of the, of the late 1980s, several thousand financial executives went to jail in the United States. And after uh, the crises of the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, which involved the internet bubble, Enron, WorldCom, uh, a smaller number of people went to prison, but a number of very senior executives did go to prison. And Elliot Spitzer in particular, as Attorney General of New York, extracted significant settlements from the investment banks, although he didn't engage in any criminal prosecutions. He, he extracted very significant civil settlements totaling over a billion dollars, which at the time was a lot of money. Now, of course, it's not, given that this crisis. I would like to say something about the broader economic situation of the United States now, because it is actually, I think, very relevant to what happened with the financial crisis and why uh, there has been so little response and so little reform in the wake of the crisis. During the 2000s, uh, when the bubble was underway and before the crisis broke, the United States had a period of what appeared to be uh, robust economic growth and prosperity. But in fact, uh, if you looked underneath the surface, we had a fake economy. We really did. And what do I mean by that? Well, the, the, the most commonly 
publicly used number to discuss this subject is, is the fact that during that decade, 40% of all corporate profits in the United States were from the financial sector, and they, they were, of course, fake profits based on this bubble um, before the crisis came. But there are a couple of other statistics about that decade that are, that are even more disturbing. And one is that, in fact, three quarters of all corporate profits came from finance, real estate, and oil. That's where money was in the United States during that decade. And in fact, if you take out oil prices, the Bush administration's huge government deficits, spending deficits, and the financial bubble, there was basically no significant economic growth in the United States during that decade, and real wages actually declined. And there was also no job creation during that decade. So in the United States now, when we see this continuation of high unemployment, and now all of these pressures on government spending, pressures on unions, pressures on public services, what we're seeing in many ways is the reality of what the American economy had actually already become, but which was temporarily masked by the real estate bubble and the financial bubble. And that, I think, is actually one of the most disturbing things about this whole situation. And I think that it's very closely connected with the question of why there hasn't been any significant reform and any significant punishment for what happened in the bubble and the crisis. And uh, to, to see that, uh, you have to go back actually several decades. The United States is a different place than it used to be in some very significant ways. And one of them, of course, is the huge uh, growth in inequality in income and wealth that has taken place in the United States over the last quarter century. At the same time, though, there's been uh, another change which is just as big, which is the role that money plays in politics. Several different roles. The obvious one is how much it costs to run a campaign. The next presidential campaign next year is probably going to cost over a billion dollars for each side. And that's, that's literally 10 times what it was a few decades ago. The role of money in American politics and American campaigns has gone up exponentially. At the same time, the expenditures that the business sector has made on lobbying have also gone up exponentially. And finally, there has, over the same period of time, arisen a gigantic gap between the salaries that are available to public sector employees, such as regulators, or people serving in Congress, and people in the private sector. Uh, there's always been a gap, but the gap used to be relatively modest, 40, 50 percent, something like that. Now it's, you know, a factor of five, a factor of 10, a factor of 100 even, in some cases. And as a consequence, you can't get good people to stay in the public sector. And even more importantly, people who are in the public sector know that if they leave and go to the private sector, they'll make 5, 10, 20 times more, and that affects their decision making. And so we've had the growth of a kind of institutional corruption in the United States. And that, um, I'm, I'm working on a book about this now, which is going to be published next year, um, with one of the people who appears in the film. Uh, Charles Morris, who you saw briefly in the trailer for the film, saying that one of his friends uh, thought that when he started making millions of dollars in the 1980s, he thought it was because he was smart, when in fact it was just because he was at the right place at the right time. And we've come to the conclusion that what happened with the, the growth of the financial sector in the United States and its deregulation and its increasing political power is connected with the United States failing to come to terms with the consequences of the information technology revolution. 
and that might sound like a very strange thing, but when the information technology revolution started in the 1960s, the 1970s, it had many effects. One was the beginnings of globalization. You could reach across the, the world and you could hire people and get things made anywhere in the world and then brought to the United States. It also meant that money could move at electronic speeds, uh, which is in some ways a good thing, but not in all. Uh, it, it created enormous volatility in the financial system, which should have been regulated, but which wasn't regulated. In fact, the opposite happened. All of the existing regulations of the financial system were essentially dismantled over a 25-year period. And uh, that allowed the dark side of the information technology revolution to show itself. And that dark side, in the case of the financial sector, is that when money can move at electronic speeds, you can have enormous damage done. Uh, things, the ability of things to go faster is not always a good thing, you know, or effectively unregulated. And that fundamentally hasn't changed. And most of us who look at these questions now, including many economists, feel that as a consequence, it's very likely that we're going to see another one of these in another 10 or 15 years. The United States is now something like number 20 in broadband telecommunications infrastructure. If you go to a place like Korea or Singapore or Japan, you get internet access at much higher speeds and much lower costs than you do in the United States. And that's a big deal. And similarly, uh, the United States is now falling behind in physical infrastructure, and it's falling behind, uh, perhaps even more importantly, in education. Uh, and public education in the United States is now facing uh, a challenge, I think, more profound than it ever has in American history. Uh, I, I went to the University of California, Berkeley. I was a beneficiary of public education in the United States. And when I went to UC Berkeley, and I got a very good education there, or at least I thought I did, um, uh, tuition at UC Berkeley was $650 a year. This year it's about 13000 And uh, that too is, is dangerous for this country. And it, it, I think, is contributing to a sense on the part of the American people that of, of fatalism, of a sense of resignation that now the United States is in the grip of this political duopoly in which the two political parties do have big differences on some questions, uh, which are important questions on abortion, on uh, gay marriage, on whether to go to war, on many social questions. Uh, on gun control, they, there are real differences between the two political parties. But, but when it comes to money, there doesn't seem to be that big of a difference at all between the two parties. And, uh, and I think that the American people have come to sense that, and that's why people don't vote anymore, and it's why people have not been nearly as angry about the lack of response and lack of reform and lack of punishment after the financial crisis as I personally would have expected previously. You know, I, I, I would have thought two years ago that, I did think two years ago, that something would be done and that if something wasn't done, that President Obama and the Congress would face a, a great deal of anger from the American people. But instead, what I sense for the most part, there is anger, of course, but, but I also sense a lot of resignation that the political system is rigged and that it's going to be a long time before it's going to be possible to do anything about this. I, if there is another crisis, I hope that its silver lining will be that uh, next time there will be a president and a Congress who will be prepared to use that political moment to do something about it. And you'll also see some, uh, some powerful, prominent, wealthy people looking really, really embarrassed and uncomfortable on camera, which... Um... <laughs>